Hey guys, welcome back. Last semester we talked about scripture, we talked about how to interpret scripture, we talked about how to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, this semester we have a very exciting topic. We're talking about morality, how to be free like Christ, how to choose what's good and find our happiness in Jesus. So today we have a few guests with us. I want to introduce them. They're two seminarians for the Diocese of Lafayette. They both study at St. Ben's in Covington. Guys, introduce yourself, please. I'm Jonathan Harris. I'm Scott Mitchell. And both the guys are here staying for a few days during the winter break in the great town of Erath. So the word morality is not used very often, but morality is the principles by which we live, how we choose, how we become more like Jesus Christ. So in some ways, you can sum up morality as choosing the, the good. And avoiding the evil. Right. And so, this is all this morality we talk about this whole semester. It's very important that we remember that it's rooted in who we are as humans. So, we're not byproducts of an accidental cosmic event, but that God made us on purpose. So, if He made us on purpose, that means that we're supposed to act in a way toward our own freedom. We have a shared human uh, experience, a shared human nature, and that we're all made for a goal. And that goal ultimately is to go to heaven heaven and be in communion communion with God for eternity. Which means that this earth, as great as it is, right, beautiful as it is, is never going to fulfill our life Completely, right? And that even though there's all kind of pleasures and beautiful things in, in this earth, they're not going to satisfy our heart because we were made for heaven. So that means that our actions will not fulfill us unless they're oriented toward heaven, God, toward God. And so since our morality is going to be based on who we are as humans, that means that our morality is objective. That's a big word. What does that mean? Well, object, object, objective means that our morality is not arbitrary, not random. Have you ever had like a, a mean teacher? Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell me something a mean teacher would do. Like, um, he would interrupt you when you're trying to learn how to serve. Like he, Father Metrojohn does. So good, okay, great. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, I had a preschool teacher that would hold me in for reasons. For no re- for, for no, no reason. for no reason. Right. Yeah. So we've all experienced people who are jerks who do things for no reason out of their own like. Egotism, right? God is not egotistical, right? God is not a dictator. So if the morality he gives us is not something arbitrary or random, right? God's not going to wake up one day and say, ketchup is a sin, right? Or yeah. driving on the right side of the road is a sin. No. It all flows from who we are as humans and the truth of who we are and the truth of who God is. So how do we find out what's right and what's wrong? How do we find out who we are? How do we find out God's plan for us? Well, we say there's two two ways. Two, you would say maybe wings, faith and reason. Faith and reason. And so what is reason? Johnny, can I explain what reason is? Yeah, reason is basically thinking, you know, trying to look at the world around you. You can see one plus one equals two. Things add up. Things make sense. It's almost designed in a certain way to where you can... And so any human yeah. on any continent at any time would all come up from the same results. They're using reason... Properly. Right. You know, it's logic. It's shared. One plus one equals two. Now, the other way we find out about uh, God's plan for us is from revelation, from faith, right? Which is from scripture and from tradition, which we find in the Catholic Church, right? Um, So, it's very important that we see that faith is not opposed to reason. So we'll, let's talk about something very controversial for a second. Let's talk about Muslims, <laughs> okay? Not very, not very popular, but often in the Muslim theology, um, their faith actually can go against their reason, right? Let's, what's a big event we could talk about in the United States that happened in our time where we saw that someone's faith went against reason? Nine eleven, right? Right. right? So a rational person would say. Killing innocent people is wrong, right? Right. Any person, you could even be an atheist and realize my common sense, reason tells me it's wrong. Right. So if faith contradicts reason, Mm -hmm. 
then it's not a true faith, right? Right. And so when God gives us the scriptures, when he gives us tradition, it doesn't contradict reason. It just builds upon it. Think of think of reason as like a good foundation, and and revelation and Christ is like the house. Right? The house doesn't take away the foundation; it builds upon it, it. builds upon it, perfects it, makes it better. So, and that's how we find about the moral law. Now, we, we think of law. Sometimes we can get uh, kind of bit out of shape. We think law. Well, that's that's down. That's negative, right? So when you're a kid in kindergarten, they have all these rules. You got to stay in the lines. What else? So you have to you have to put obey people obey people with your hand your lip yeah. hand on the hip, right? Right. Uh, but law itself is not a bad thing. Think about nature for a second. If I drop something, it's gonna what? Because of gravity. The law of gravity, right? The law of gravity. Yeah. You know, if I do not drink enough water, I'm going to what? Die. <laughs> Die or dehydrate because of the law of my body. There's an order, a logic, a goodness to everything because God creates everything out of his wisdom. So law is that which orders things toward their own happiness. Right. Um, toward what they were meant to be. So law is not a bad thing. Actually, law is actually what helps us become who we're meant to be. Now, God's law is very different than our laws. human law, right? right? So let's think of a bad human law, for example. So in the South, for a long, long time, there was something called Jim Crow. Right. Uh, what is Jim Crow? Jim Crow laws, basically, uh, shoot. Yeah. Jim Crow laws were a set of laws that... Uh, in, enshrined racism into against, right, so saying that certain right. people could use certain fountains or right, right, basically segregation between you know white people and other people. So the buses only whites can sit in the front, right? Blacks sit in the back. Obviously, that's not a good law. Yeah, that's not yeah, a good law, unjust. right? Unjust. So in human law, sometimes there could be errors, but there can never be error in God's law, right? God is not capable of error. So God's not going to make uh, bad laws. So I think it's important to start from that kind of basic understanding. Now, everything, as we said, about morality, what's good and what's bad, is based in who we are as humans. And so we're going to talk about nature for a second. When you you think of nature, you think of often, you think of what? The birds, the animals, monkeys. Uh, the beautiful sky, right? But we're going to use nature here in a different sense. A nature, nature answers the question, "What?" Right. So the nature of this mug is to be a, a, mug. a mug, right? Yeah. The nature of this microphone is to be a, a microphone, microphone, right? If I use the the mug as a mic as a microphone, or the microphone as a mug. No, you're going to have a wet microphone. I'm going to have a wet microphone, right? Yeah. I'm going to get I'm going to get electrocuted, yeah. right? And I'm going to lose more hair than I have. Yeah. Um, so humans have a nature too. We have a what. And the what is how God created us as humans. And since God created all of us, we all descend from the same parents. We all share the same human nature. Right. Meaning that no matter what century you live in, no matter what country you live in, no matter how much money you have or what culture you live in, <clears throat> human nature is always... The same. The same. Does not change. Mm-hmm. Right? And this is why you can read old works like St. Augustine or Aristotle. And you can realize the way they speak about their human experience is the exact same as us. Right? The human heart doesn't change. Right. Human nature doesn't change. And so because we have a common human nature, mm-hmm. we can talk about human rights right. and human dignity. We all share the same human nature. We all share the same human rights and the human dignity. Now, we're going to talk about defining what it means to be a human being. So here's a a simple definition, and we'll we'll take it part by part. A human being is a rational being comprised of body and soul who is designed for happiness. Let's say that all together. A human person is a rational being comprised of body and soul who designed for happiness. Let's talk about the first phrase. A human person is a rational being. Rational referring to the fact that we can 
Think. Think. And we can even think about thinking, right? That's right. Our, yeah, animals are not capable of thinking of thinking. So the only beings that are rational are human. Human and angels, right? Right. And we get both of this, uh, uh, our angels and humans get their ability to think from God. Right? We're made the image and likeness of God. God ha- has a divine intellect. God has a divine will. And so we're like God, this have the spark of God in us. We're able to think. We're able to choose. We're able to make good choices and useful things. So that's what makes us so different from the rest of creation. And so because we're rational, we're actually the only beings in the physical universe that God created for their own sake. In a certain sense, everything God created created was for his glory, but also to be useful in some way to us. Right. And so rational being is kind of the first aspect of a, of a human person. That's what separates us from the animals, from the rocks, from the plants, mm-hmm. that we're able to know truth and to choose what is good. Now, being humans also means that we're interdependent. Right? When I learn something, I learn it from... Another. another person, right? right. Even think of my, the moment of my conception, I'm in someone else's womb, right? I depend on my mother for life, life, nutrition, yeah. nutrition. Uh, everything. So our whole life, we are interdependent, dependent on other people. And that's part of the rational uh, process of who we are as humans. We're meant to learn from each other. So we're not only rational, but we also have a body and a, and, a yeah. soul, and a soul. Let's talk about the body first. So ex- explain the body. The body is that, you know, that corporeal, that flesh, that, that physical part of you that you can feel, touch, that others can experience. And so we, so I mean, that's every part of us that we, we can see, experience, measure. Yes. Um, and so we're meant to have bodies as humans, right? Right. And so this is why death is so unnatural, that the body is not just a shell for the spirit, but it's it's part of, it. part of who we are. And this is why we believe at the end of time, when Christ comes again, everyone in heaven will get their, their bodies back, the resurrection of the body. Right, so, right. Beautiful. And this is why Christ, one of the reasons he took on human flesh, nature. So he could teach us about our own selves, you know? Right. So we have a body, but we also have something a little more important than the body, and that is our soul. Soul. And so we're going to talk about, Johnny's going to talk about a little bit about, about the soul and why it's immortal and how we can prove it. Yeah, so think about it. Every person is made in the image and likeness of God. God is the source of goodness itself, right? And what is good is opposed to what is bad. So we're made for what is good. Now, if you really think about it, Death is kind of contrary to human nature, you know, because we're thinking beings. We can think about eternal things. Therefore, we're not made for things that are fleeting and passing away, but we're meant to participate in what's eternal. So that's kind of how the soul, you know, kind of latches on to God, kind of connects to God because we're made for God. And therefore, our soul is made for God. It's made to be united to him. Right. So it doesn't it's. Not capable of passing away. So what are some reasons, how, ways we can show that we have a soul? Show that we can have a, that we do have a soul is one by one that we think at all. That, that there's something beyond the, the flesh that we have this idea of identity. We understand, you know, that I'm Scott Mitchell and you are Mark Mitchell and that we can't be either. Mm-hmm. Like, right. Uh, you see two identical twins. Mm-hmm. They right. look the same. They might have the same DNA, the same yeah. body, mm-hmm. but they're different people. Right. Yeah. Different beings. Or, yeah. Or even, different even the fact that you're alive, because you know something has to move the body, and we're shown this by death. We see that things die and they pass away, and that there's something that animates the body apart from something inside of it that has gone after death. That is gone after death. Right. It is missing. And so our soul is not temporary, but our soul ultimately is immortal. immortal. And, and, the, and this is kind of proven by the fact that we desire things that last. Right. Like there's nothing in this earth seems to ever like satisfy. You can have like the mama's best pecan pie, or you can finally date the quarterback you always wanted to date, or the cheerleader you always want to date. And guess what? 
They're not as great as you thought. <laughs> there's always going to be a tinge of sadness. Or, or, that you, there's something more that doesn't fully satisfy. Yeah, or you can you can kind of think of it like Netflix. A lot of kids, I, I like Netflix. You go and you watch a show, you get hooked on it, and then it ends. And then there's always that kind of feeling of emptiness. You want it to go on, you want another episode. And that's good because you want something that's lasting. And but so, nothing on this earth right. is lasting. That proves the fact that our soul is immortal, is eternal. Right. And so there's another part of a human. So we, we are rational. I mean, we can think and choose. We have a body. We have a soul. But we're also designed to want happiness, right. to want our own happiness. And happiness means more than just a fleeting emotion. We want our own fulfillment. We want our own flourishing. Mm. We're designed for that. And so that's what sets us apart as humans, that we're designed by our free will to want to choose what makes us happy. And this comes in the moral life, when we choose what's right and avoid what's wrong. Now, sometimes we make the wrong choices. We call that a sin. Mm. And that leads us away from our own happiness, away from our own dignity. So the more we take our actions and subordinate them to Jesus, the happier we can become. So let's talk about happiness itself. Let's kind of de- delve into happiness. Now, nothing in this earth, like we said a little while ago, is going to fully satisfy us. It's going to is always going to disappoint us. And even the greatest things. Think, think of the greatest things that life can offer. Think of uh, wealth, or honor, or glory, or even health, or even friendships. None of these things will fully satisfy us, right? right? There's something more that we want. right? And then we can only find that in God. This is why it's very interesting sometimes <laughs> I go visit like the poor in our parish who are very holy, mm-hmm. but they don't have a lot, and they're happier sometimes. Right, because they're not attached to those fleeting things. And they're attached to Christ. Right. To Christ is eternal. Now, sometimes we think we know what makes us happy, but we can often be... <laughs> Wrong, wrong right? right? Yeah. Think, think of the kid in the candy store. He screams, "Mom, mom, I want that uh, uh, the the bag of M and M's, right?" The diabetic kid who's screaming, "I want M and M's," right? He thinks it's going to make him happy, right? But it's not. Right? Right. It's, 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 it's going it's to hurt him. It's going to kill him. So we'll give you some examples of how we can be wrong about what's good for us. First, there are some things that we think are good for us, but are actually or not. Right. A famous thing today, it's very common, is pornography. Pornography, right? On people's smartphones and their laptops. That people think, well, pornography images of people will make me happy. But honestly, that's something that's bad for us. It's not something that's not something just that the church says, but even psychologists and sociologists say this is not healthy mm-hmm. for the human person. Think of, think of drugs, think of getting drunk. All these things we think, this will make me happy, right? but ultimately it won't. Another way we could be wrong is that we could choose a lesser good over a greater good. So, for example, say you have to study for a test, but you're playing video games. Is video games a bad thing? No. Video games is a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. But if I use my video games, uh, my time of homework to play the video games... I'm choosing a lesser good over a greater good. Another thing, too, sometimes we use the wrong road to get to the goal we want to get. So, for example, is going to Baton Rouge a bad thing? It could be. Is going to Baton Rouge a bad thing? Intrinsically, no, it's not a bad thing. Right? But I can choose a good way to get there. I could choose a bad way to get there. That's right. I could walk. I could take a bicycle. I could take an Uber. Right, I could call Taunt Snook to drive me. All those are good options, right? Don't fly there. Uh, you could fly there, but I could hijack someone and steal their car. Right? Yeah. That would be a bad option, right? Okay. Uh, so sometimes I use a bad way to get to a good thing, right? So for example, um, someone is studying in med- medical school to be a doctor, and they get pregnant. And they say, well, I want to be a doctor, which is a good thing. Well, therefore, I must have an abortion uh, in order order to continue, right? So the the good of wanting to be a doctor is a good thing, but they're choosing a bad way to get there by killing their own child, right? Rather than having adoption or or, or marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Um, 
a lot of times like this too. Like for example, we'll talk about it more in the future, but uh, sometimes a husband and wife need to not have a kid for a while, space a kid. Maybe they're very, very poor or they have health issues and they say, look, we can't handle another child right now. So we need a space having a child right now, which might be a good thing, but they might use a bad way to get there, right? They might use right. contraception or, or condoms and things like this, which are wrong, right? Uh, but God gives us a, a true way, natural family planning, that we can use for that. So let's talk about our desires as humans. We're, we're filled with all kinds of desires, and we were designed that way. So think of a child who's not even fully aware intellectually yet. One of the first things that happens is they, they want to eat, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, why do they want to eat? Because their desires tell them that food is pleasurable. Right? Yeah. Well, God, first, I mean, they feel hunger. They feel right. hungry. They have a need for something that they don't have. And so that that hunger is a desire. Right. So that hunger is given to them by God so that they can eat, so that they can live. God gives all kinds of desires like this. For example, uh, maybe loneliness could be, uh, in a certain sense, a, a cue to our desire for community. community, other people. So all of our emotions, all of our feelings... <laughs> All of our drives were designed by God on purpose. Um, even sexuality, right? Sexuality is a pleasurable thing, so the human race continues, right? right? So that people reproduce. The problem is original sin, right? So mm-hmm. we have good desires, but original sin can kind of darken our desires or put them in the wrong direction. I'll give you an example. Eating an Oreo cookie. <laughs> good thing or bad thing? Good. Good thing, yeah. right? God gives Oreos because he loves us, right? So I see Oreo and I want one. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing. But if I desire to have 15 Oreos, right? Right. That's a bad thing. It's a disorder. My good desire kind of gets skewed. Think of a um, when you go to shop binds and you got a, a shopping cart and one of the wheels is like, you ever get that squeaky or it wants to pull to the left or the right, right? Mm-hmm. The shopping cart is a good thing. It's still working, mm-hmm. but it's, you got to push it a little bit because it wants to go to the wrong right. wrong side. Yeah. Wrong side, so, wrong direction. I thought you brought up a good point when you min- mentioned original sin. And that uh, kind of recalls Genesis. Remember, we talked in scripture last year, I'm sure, about Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered the world. And so their nature, right? God made them for all these good things that fell. Right, Father? So that's a good way of thinking of it is how we desire good things, but sometimes because our nature is fallen, we want to use the good things to the ends they weren't made for. Right. We make them our goal instead of instead of means. Right. Or we want to use them in the wrong way. Right. right. So the I, the food and sex are pleasurable, but right. they have to be in their proper context, right? So if I eat four hamburgers a day, right, it's it's not good for me, right? If I have sex outside of marriage, right, it's, it's not good for me, right? It's detached from its purpose. Uh, exactly, detached from what it's meant to be. So this is very important when we talk about, or, and we'll talk more in depth about this later in the semester, about a very pressing kind of topic in our society today. Those who struggle with same-sex attraction, right? right. So those people who have same-sex attraction, so commonly sometimes they'll call themselves gay or lesbian, right? People say, well, God made them that way. Well, not really, right? Did God give them sexual desire? Yes. yes. Did God give uh, Father Metrodon desire to want to have an Oreo cookie? Yes, yes, right? But the fact that Father Metrodon wants 10 Oreo cookies... Instead of one Oreo cookie, right? That's is, good. That's a result of original sin, right? That's a result of something that's fallen. So the same thing with sexual desire. Everyone should want to, uh, by nature, want to get married and have a committed relationship with someone else. Mm-hmm. But when someone's attracted to someone else of the same sex, it's a cross because their good desire for sexuality gets uh, skewed towards something wrong. Does that mean that the person who has same-sex attraction is uh, intrinsically evil, the person himself? No. no. Does that mean Father Metron, because he wants 10 cookies instead of one cookie, is evil? No. Right. But every everybody, all of us, because of original sin, are going to have bad desires that we have to, what, fight. 
Right. So we have to all pick up, what does Christ say? We all have to pick up our cross and follow him. So everyone has their own cross. So we, we don't identify ourselves by our desires, which is so freeing, right? right. I'm a, we're all children of God, no matter what I desire or what I don't. So think, of, think of the alcoholic. Well, all they want to do, they know that the worst thing for them is to drink another drink. Right. And all they want is another drink. And to know that just because they desire the wrong thing doesn't mean that they're uh, forgotten by God or they're different or they have a different nature. Mm-hmm. No, we all have the same human nature. We're all children of God. And that, that's comforting for the alcoholic to know, look, even though I have this desire to have the wrong thing, I can choose not to fulfill that. Right. Not right. to not to have to drink, and I'm going to be happy. Right, you can choose a greater good too. Trades, right. So for the for that for the person who wants to drink, it'd be not having any alcohol, right? Right, and maybe even taking money they would spend on alcohol and doing something good, good with it, and helping other people. Right. And so the same thing with someone with same sex attraction. Someone with same sex attraction has no less dignity than anybody else. Is Christ died for them just as much as everybody else? They're not different. They're not a different category of people. They just happen to have this particular desire that's in the wrong direction, just as we all do, right? Some of us want to get very angry. Some of us want to be very envious. Some of us want to be um, just very prideful, right? We're all going to struggle with our different desires that are struggled point in the wrong direction. But going going through holiness helps us over time to heal the desires to want to be pointed toward what is right. That's important. So God did not create us to have the bad desires. Right. He gave us good desires, but our own sin sin can often make it want to yeah. point in the wrong direction. That's, that's like, like the shopping cart of champagne. Right. Yeah. And so I think the uh, whole example of same-sex attraction really points to something as well in that it, by saying I am gay or I am lesbian or even saying, oh, I'm homosexual, I'm heterosexual, you know, you're doing something, you're identifying with something that you're not, and by doing that, you're reducing yourself. Well, you, you reduce ultimate. yourself to your desires. Right. Right. I don't call myself the 10 Oreo guy. Right. You call yourself a <laughs> human being. I'm a human being. I'm a child of God. Right. And so not, none of us are different because of our, uh, of our desires. Desires in and of themselves are neither sinful by themselves, right? Right. The fact that I want 10 Oreos is, is, is not sinful. If I start thinking about and, and have these fantasies about, oh, I want to have these 10 Oreos, how great it's going to be, right? right. I'm, I'm sinning, right? If I actually go eat the 10 Oreos, I'm sinning. Right. But the fact that I have this initial impulse to want to have it is just a cross. Right. That's what I do with it um, that ultimately matters, right? So I think that's just important to realize. Our desires are good. Mm-hmm. Think, think of another one, anger. Yeah. Why did God give us anger? To combat injustice. Right. So when I see an injustice... I should be angry. Right. However, sometimes our anger gets out of proportion. So like you steal my pencil, right? Mm-hmm. And I should be mad for like two seconds, but I don't talk to you for 10 years, right? Right. <laughs> right? You cut me off in traffic. He's really done that. And I flip you off, right? Yeah. Right? I should be mad that you cut me off, but I shouldn't be I shouldn't be cursing you out, right? Right. Uh, and so sometimes or the opposite. Sometimes this happens a lot. There's an injustice. And I don't, I don't want to get mad, right? So let's take take the example of the legalization of abortion. Some people like to say, well, I don't want to get too mad about that because I don't want to step on other people's toes, right? But we should be mad because yeah. those people in the womb are our brothers and sisters, right? Yeah, They're no different than any, any of us. So we should be angry about abortion right. in the healthy way. And so uh, think of um, – you ever uh, – like pressure wash something, a pressure washing machine, right? Oh yeah. If you don't, if you put the nozzle, if you put it too wide, it's not gonna have any what pressure, right? If you put it too strong, it's gonna like destroy the window, right? That's when you pressure right. wash, it. you gotta have just the right, reach the right uh, combination of, of things. So the same thing with their emotions; they're meant to have a certain sweet spot, right? And when they're not in that sweet spot, it's because of original sin, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so this points to something else we're going to call natural law. Remember we said law is a good thing. But when God created that, the, the universe, he created us, he put a law into all of our hearts. Mm-hmm. So this is why you go to any time in history of human history, and you'll see that everyone kind of has a general consensus of some basic things, right? Almost every country, if I steal something... <clears throat> You're gonna get yeah, punished. You're gonna get punished. I'm gonna get punished, right? If I kill an innocent person, I'm gonna get right. No one told us when you when kids play in the sandbox, 
and they kill take the other kid's toy. What does the kid say right away? That's not fair. Yeah. No one told the kid it wasn't fair. Right. He knows it in his gut. Right. And that gut understanding is called natural law. Natural law. Johnny, tell us a little bit about natural law. Yeah, so good way to think about it is that everything is made with a purpose. And whenever it acts against that purpose, it does harm to that thing because it does violence to its nature. It's not what it's made for. So we were talking earlier that father has a microphone in a coffee cup, right? Puts coffee on his microphone and it's not going to work. Same thing with a coffee cup. In the same way, whenever I use my human nature, my free will, for something that is opposed to my nature goodness, because I'm made in the image and likeness of God, it's going to make me unhappy. It might make me feel pleasurable for a time, maybe, but ultimately it it's not good for me. Now, even if I'm not a religious person... Right. Even if I've never heard of the name of Jesus Christ, I can come to know natural law. Right. Natural law is accessible to all people. I mean, think so, of Ten Commandments. Take, take commandments. Most of those right. are. But think of even when, when the Christian missionaries went mm-hmm. to China, they found out about this guy named Confucius. Right. Confucius had a basic philosophy that was very much based on natural law. No one told Confucius. These was right, this was wrong. No. But through common sense and reason, right, it was discoverable. He dis- discovered what is was true. So all of our morality is based in a certain sense on the foundation mm-hmm. of natural law. Right? The foundation doesn't change. This is so important. Because since our human nature doesn't change, right. That means our law doesn't change, right? right. So a lot of people say, well, look, we're we're the best. Time in human history, we have iPhones, right? We can we can go to Mars. We have Elon Musk, right? Who else had who Elon Musk? We're the best, right? But just because our technology is different doesn't mean our human nature is different, which means that what's right and what's wrong mm-hmm. stays, the same. stays the same, right? right? That doesn't change. Even though technology evolves, mm-hmm. human nature doesn't evolve, and morality doesn't evolve, and it stays the same. And anybody, even with common sense, even an atheist, can, can come to see what natural law is, right? Even when I got the March for Life, when we protest abortion, there's a group of says atheists for life, right? Right. There's some people who know that there's even people, you know, um, so that's just good to know that it comes from human reason and that it's not arbitrary, right? right? Like we, we said, we've all had bad teachers who made up random rules and made no sense. God's yeah. not like that. It, it's objective. And that's, that's because you said earlier, you know, it's objective. It's something that's fixed. It's not something that's arbitrary, arbitrary or fading. And that's because the the natural law is a reflection of the divine law, God's law, and who God is. Because everything, right, is made in the image and likeness of God, especially man, because man can think about God. Now, we can all come to know natural law. Right. Sometimes it can be hard to follow natural law. Because of original sin, sin right? right? What does original sin do? It darkens our mind, right? Sin makes us dumb, right? <laughs> right? Sin makes us stupid, right? And so we also, because of original sin, we want things that are not good for us. Good for us. So right? St. Augustine actually paints this image because we're made in the image and likeness of God, right? So we're made to be in a specific way. So what it, original sin does, you know, if you think about God perfect, Right, it mars that image. It defaces it. It kind of, you know, dashes it, darkens it, as you say. Mm-hmm. So there is now distance between what is good and what man is made for, and uh, what he is not. It, it becomes confused, mm-hmm. blurry, almost. And this is why <clears throat> the more we sharpen our reason, right, in some ways, our intellect, the more we're able to see more clearly. Right. What's right and, and what's wrong. Take so, Father's philosophy class. Well, okay. So we, we know, come to know about morality, not just from reason, but also from Jesus Christ, right? right? Jesus Christ tells us why we're here, who we are, and our goal of getting to heaven. So it's both the mind and the Bible, right? And right. tradition all at the same time. So we're going to talk about um, how God shows us that we have freedom, right? So when, at the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Exodus, God tells Israel that these are the Ten Commandments, right? And that you should choose these if you want to be happy, right? So each of us is given 
uh, we see in the Bible, God, we're made in God's image and likeness, which means we have a freedom, right. right? A freedom to choose what is right. And that we're able to come to understand ourselves more and more in the very person of Christ. And so the Bible and, and tradition teaches us uh, more about morality, more than what just reason teaches us. And also that we only can find true happiness in getting close to the sacred heart of Jesus, right? right. Think, of, think of the sacred heart of Jesus is a beating. Christ has a flesh heart that beats blood eternally. Right now in heaven, Christ has a beating heart. Boom, 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 boom. For all eternity, it'll be beating for you, right? For each one of us. It's going to be beating out of love. And so this human heart of Christ tells us who we are and that we're only going to be happy if we're in intimacy with him. And that we become more and more like him, uh, giving self-sacrificially in love. And that we're meant to be close to the whole trinity. And then Christ tells us, in his first homily, Jesus goes up a mountain uh, in Matthew 5 and gives us a sermon on the mountain. And the first thing he says is, blessed are the poor. And you can say blessed in the way, way for say is happy. Right. right happy he says happy. Happy, happy the poor. Yeah. Happy are those who mourn. Right. Happy are those who suffer because of righteousness. That's right. crazy, right? Think about this for a second. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna be happy because I'm poor. I'm gonna be happy because I'm born. It makes no sense. But Christ is telling us that when we pick up our cross and follow him, mm-hmm. that he will make us happy. Right. That his grace will make us happy. And so we it's not the world that's gonna make us happy, it's following Christ. And becoming disciples with him. So I think a couple things to wrap up. We want to remember. This whole semester we're talking about morality. What's right and what's wrong. Right. These are not rules that come from the outside. No. These are rules that flow from who we are. Right. And that each of us has the same human nature. God is not arbitrary. And what's going to make me happy. Make me fulfilled is to become more like Christ is calling me to be, what I was made for, Mm -hmm. which is heaven. So sin is not sin because Christ said so. Sin is sin because it's bad for us. And bad for everybody. And bad for everybody, bad for our human nature. And makes us less of who we are meant to be, right? Think if I have a car that can only take diesel, right? And I put unleaded gas in it, what's going to happen? It's going to cock out. It's going to break, right? That's sin. Mm -hmm. It might feel good for a second, right? But yeah. ultimately, it's not going to help me be who I, I want to be. And so the more I sin, the more I tend to want to sin even more. Mm-hmm. But the more I grow in virtue, which we're talking about next time, and, and holiness, the more I want to become more like Christ. More like Christ, more, more like holy. Any closing thoughts, guys, you want to kind of end with? All right. Well, thank you guys for being with us today. And we hope you all have a good week, guys. And good luck with the first session. If you have any questions, please send me an email and talk to you later. God bless.